Let me begin by welcoming everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. Uh, my name is Brian Alexander. I'm the host, cat herder, and creator of the forum, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. Right. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to welcome our guest this week. Uh, professor Robert Talbert is a professor of mathematics at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. Um, not only is he a mathematician, not only is he helping run his department, but on the side, he investigates the best way to teach mathematics, including with technology. He's recently published a very exciting book on the flipped classroom methodology, and I'm really grateful for him to come so that we can talk about what it means to flip a classroom in 2019. Professor Talbert, welcome. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I'm glad you're here. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. Um, you're coming to us from Michigan, so I'm guessing it's going to be a little chilly right now. Uh, it's not too bad, 40-ish degrees. You know, we're through the 20s, to through the snow, the January and November thing. So uh, I, I'll take it. Well, it's 40 above zero. I mean, that's the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, let, let me ask, as a way of getting to introduce people, I've told them your title. I've told them about your book. Mm -hmm. Let me ask this question. What do you anticipate spending most of your time and thinking on uh, for the next year? Um, well, I can split that into personal and work. <laughs> I've got, I've got uh, three teenage kids at home, so I spend a lot of time thinking about them and uh, what, what uh, they need, I guess. Um, but here at work at Grand Valley State, I'm a professor in the math department, but I'm also currently the department chair in the math department. And uh, we have, uh, we're, we're undergoing some very interesting changes at Grand Valley. Uh, we have a new president, uh, a relatively new provost. Uh, we're getting a new dean in our college. And so there's a lot of leadership turnover a lot of really good questions being asked about the future of higher education, actually, and what it means for us here mm -hmm. at GBSU, and uh, investigating some pretty pretty bold potential moves uh, university-wide. And so I, as a department chair, I'm thinking about how do I make this work? How do I enact these big ideas kind of on the human scale when I have to think about salary, workload, personnel evaluation, student complaints, facilities, and the whole nine yards. So uh, that, that uh, keeps me thinking a lot, and I'll probably will be thinking about that for some time to come. Wow, that's a very impressive strategic perspective. I mean, into which you can work your research about teaching and learning, but it adds to it all that administrative layer. It's true, it's true. Wow, and you'll be teaching at the same time too, right? Uh, I'm teaching one class right now, but I have no classes next semester actually, because I normally teach six credits a year and I'm teaching a single five credit course right now. So I, uh, since I'm new to this, I kind of fell into the position. I wasn't actually looking to be department chair, but we had some leadership turnover and I was in kind of the right place at the right time. I said, um, if I'm going to be learning this stuff on the job, I want a little bit of relief from teaching. <laughs> teaching is not something I need relief from, but it's nice to have single-minded focus on learning how to do the job I actually have in front of me. So. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, on behalf of everybody who thinks about the future of education, we're glad to hear someone as foresightful as yourself uh, taking a hand at the helm. Good luck. Thanks. Um, now, before we proceed, just friends, if you're new to the forum, um, and I, I do want to thank people who have just come in, folks like uh, Eli, Carl, Teresa, Stacey, Roxanne, Chi, Teresa, and Annette. Um, the way this works is I have a ton of questions which I can ask a poor guest. So we can put this into a simple interrogation, but I'd rather not. The real strength of this technology, the real strength of the forum is that you will get to participate. You get to ask your questions. So what I'd like you to think about is what you'd like to ask this expert in flipped classrooms. For example, uh, do you are you in the middle of a flipping exercise and you'd like to seek good advice? Are you leading a, a large programmatic effort uh, to flip, pro, you know, flip classes in a school or a department or a division? Um, have you had some experience and you'd like to share your thoughts? Or would you like to ask the most basic questions like, what the heck is a flipped classroom? What does that mean in 2019? <clears throat> All these questions are welcome. We're glad to hear them. So just either press the question mark button and type in your question so I can flash it and read it out loud. Or if your camera is on, we're friendly. We won't bite. Just <laughs> press the raised hand button and you can join us up here on stage. Um, so let, let me just ask, just to get the ball rolling while people are they're bringing, they're percolating and thinking. Um, how do you define the flipped classroom right now? Sure. Well, a flipped classroom, I, I tend to say the word flipped learning instead of flipped classroom because mm -hmm. I try to de-emphasize the idea of a classroom because this is an idea that can take place in any sort of modality, whether it's online or hybrid or in any sort of situation. It's a pedagogical approach where 
your the student's first contact with new ideas does not happen in a shared group environment, but rather before that group environment takes place on the student's end in their individual spaces. That's where they receive first contact with new ideas uh, through some sort of structured activity. Okay, And so what that does is it frees up time and space in the group activity group space when that when that comes around, whether it's a, a regular uh, classroom setting or whether it's an online uh, group discussion board participation, it frees that up for more active learning. Okay? It becomes some place where students are taking the basics which they have learned uh, on their own prior to the group setting right. and then taking them a couple of notches up to more of the analysis and application level when everybody's together. Uh, and so that group space is transformed into something that's really dynamic, focused on applications and analysis and in creative engagement. Well, that sounds like the first, I mean, I have to say, um, if I imagine myself as someone new to the field, that's a very, very clear term. Uh, it's a very clear description of how flipped, how flipped learning works, and I appreciate your distinction. Uh, as someone who's been doing this, um, I, I think you nailed it. I mean, that's, that's, that's really, really precise. Especially like the way at the end that you unfold the real variety and potential of what we can do in the new type of classroom this way. Sure. Yeah. It's it's all about optimizing and maximizing the amount of act, active learning, generally speaking, that takes place in the students' learning environments. Uh, if you contrast it with uh, a traditional classroom setup, which we all know and we've all been through, uh, you come into a group setting. Basically, it's assumed that you're tabula rasa, that you have no idea, you've never studied or never touched or shook hands with the new concepts. You get them right there in the group setting. And then you are sent out of the group setting to your individual context in your dorm room, in your apartment, whatever, and then you're supposed to work this out. And so that to me seems like a misalignment of the context and the activity, okay? We're giving the simplest activities to students when we have the most amount of help available and we're taking away the help when they're reaching the most complex activities. Mm. So what flipping does is it just merely aligns the context with the activity and makes everything active. I mean, I think we've seen, a lot of us have seen the studies, the Freeman study mm. in preceding the National Academy of Sciences and all the science that's out there that, that is pointing towards active learning being the best sort of uh, approach for students. And so we should be asking ourselves, like, how do I get this active learning into as many cracks and crevices into my students' learning experiences as humanly possible. And so flip learning is one way to do that by making the individual space active and the group space active at the same time. Mm. So it's a, it's a species of active learning. Um, uh, friends, I, I'm, I'm gonna run um, a, a story um, past our guest, um, but again, I would, I would love to hear uh, what thoughts you have, uh, what questions, um, and as well, uh, any objections, any pushback, anything where this can't work for me or I, I wonder about the problem. Mm -hmm. um, my story is actually about my wife. Um, Karedwin uh, inherited a class uh, on emergency services uh, where the students would take the class and at the end of the class, they would have to take a certifying exam. And the pass rate for the exam when she inherited this was very low, something like 20%. Uh, well, it turned out that the class curriculum she inherited was entirely lecture-based, with lectures lasting up to four hours at a time. Sure. Um, and, uh, and this was a very practical class where people would have to learn how to do triage, have to learn how to you know, pick up people on, on stretchers and that kind of thing. So she took all the classes, uh, turned them into audio files, and published them as podcasts, uh, made them available to the students, and then turned the class entirely into discussion, face-to-face uh, -face conversation, but also to role-playing. Um, and after some dizzying moments from the students, the pass rate went up to something like 75%. Yeah. It was just, would this be a good example of a uh, flipped classroom in your case? Oh, absolutely. So it turns out when you are trying to teach people how to do things, they learn it best by actually doing the things. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that when we look to our own experiences in the past, like everything that we know, everything that we're good at doing, that we really value in our lives, we learn by doing it at some point. And if there's a lecture involved, it's really only useful to the extent that it impels us to do things. Uh, and so it's in the doing that we actually do the learning. So I would say absolutely yes. I mean, do the students get first contact with these uh, ideas of emergency services through before a group setting in their individual spaces through a structured activity? 
Yes. Okay. Uh, did they use the group space? Did your wife use the group space to structure it into an active and dynamic applications oriented learning environment where students are working together, they're failing together, they're figuring it out together? Yes. So, I mean, that's that to me is absolutely flip learning. It's very active and it's focused and it's structured. Well, this sounds well. Oh, so, um, my wife would be very pleased to hear this. Um, and, um, I want to uh, I want to hear from everybody else. Um, do you have any examples of this? Uh, have you yourselves um, uh, been doing this? Have you flipped a class um, or part of a class, um, or are you looking to do that? Um, and right now we have a quick question. This comes up from the awesome Roxanne Riskin, and we just put this on the screen for everyone to see. Um, she would like to know what are the what are the best technologies. Um, that best support active learning, like web annotation through hypothesis, et cetera? Great, well, I would say that the technology envelope that you put around a flipped learning environment, first of all, I, I, I gave that definition a while ago specifically to be quite technology agnostic. Uh, you notice there was no mention of, you gotta have a video present or something like that, um, because I kind of feel like the technology is there in service of the active learning and the environment you're creating. But to answer your question, um, it, it varies quite heavily from discipline to discipline. Uh, in my discipline of mathematics, uh, web annotation like Hypothesis is a great tool, uh, Perusal is another a great tool. Ooh. If I had a text that I wanted students to mark up socially as part of, and that's the way I want them to get their first contact with new ideas prior to the classroom, that's a great technology to use. Uh, in mathematics, uh, quite often, the best way for students to get first contact with a concept is by playing with an idea through a demo. And so I use a tool called Desmos.com. It's an online free graphing calculator tool. And mm -hmm. I will often set them students up with uh, you know, some sort of demo to play with. It allows to create little interactive graphs and so forth. Like right now, my pre-calculus students are learning about polynomial functions and what the parts of a polynomial function do. And so rather than give them a video about this, I did give them a video about this and a text to read, but I gave them this interactive uh, little applet. And I uh, said, so go to this applet and play around a little bit and tell me what you see. That's their, that's their pre-class work. And so we come into class uh, or to the discussion board because it's mm -hmm. a hybrid class, uh, meets once a week, it's online the rest of the time. And that's their first contact with new ideas. So there are, the, the technology, again, is quite dependent on the situation. Like your wife's emergency services, the audio file thing was probably the right choice because that's what you had available. Uh, for others who are in sort of the health sciences field, uh, I know our nursing program at Grand Valley does a, a, quite a lot of flip learning and they're very heavily into uh, simulations, uh, quite, pretty similar to the emergency services thing. So they have, their technology looks like mannequins. That's what it is. <laughs> That's their educational technology that they use is like life-size dummies that have like realistic body parts on the inside and so on. Um, I have a, a, a colleague, uh, Matt Roberts at Grand Valley, he just compute, uh, political science, and he uses hypothesis to have students mark up and discuss uh, Supreme Court decisions before they come into class to do even further discussion on this. So, uh, so, and there are tools for science, there are tools for history, there are tools for just sort of text in general. If, if I had to give one straight answer to that question, uh, if, it's, if it's a textual approach that you're taking, I think hypothesis and perusal are very good tools, uh, but also it, it can be done with very little technology whatsoever. Um, I think that you could possibly flip a class without using any sort of digital technology if you really put your mind to it. I've heard from uh, uh, some people in the humanities, which is uh, my background, they will say that they've been uh, flipping the classroom forever because mm -hmm. you know they assign students to read a text in philosophy or history, and, and then when they come to class, they discuss it. Um, well, my usual rejoinder is, well, how much lecturing do they do? And they usually say, oh, none at all, but it turns out there's actually a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's often not much structure in the assignment. And that's why for me, when, when I talk about flip learning it involves structured activities before the group space happens. OK, so students are getting first contact in their individual space through a structured activity. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say, well, we've been flipping the classroom for 600 years. But what they mean by that is like I give my students, I say, read chapter three and come ready to discuss. Well, that's not a lot of structure. And, you know, students don't necessarily know how to read a text in the way that we mean them to read a text. And so if you're really flipping a class in that sense, you would have 
read chapter three and come ready to discuss, but you might also have some guided notes to kind of help students point their attention in the right place, to draw out the information you want them to have, and in some way, teach them how to learn and have an instructional presence with them, even though you are not physically with them. Just giving students chapter three to read and saying, come to class ready to discuss is not enough structure for the vast majority of students that we have, or, or that people 600 years ago would have had either, for that matter. Well, well true, depending on, on, on your students, yeah. Mm -hmm. So a key thing here is the use of structure uh, for the out-of-class assignments. Um, you know, this is a good point. Um, then, um, Roxanne, uh, I'm actually gonna beam you up on stage because you have another question and I, I just can't keep reading you without having it, you know, having you on stage. Um, Roxanne, your question is on a fully online course. Hi, Roxanne. Hi, Ryan. Hi, thank you for answering so uh, richly those um, questions that I had. Um, this one is, how would you flip a fully online class? Well, that's a great question. I've actually done it twice. Uh, and I've also hybrid courses because I have taught online and hybrid courses here at Grand Valley. Uh, the definition still applies, okay? So there is an individual space and a group space. It's not a physical space. It's more of a context, okay? Uh, and so un unless we're talking about a synchronous online course, I'm, I'm thinking of asynchronous online right. courses where there's no meeting whatsoever. I think that's that's uh, it seems to be the majority of online courses out there. So in those courses, you will want students to engage with some very basic sort of the, the bottom two levels of Bloom's taxonomy, just understanding and remembering mm -hmm. uh, on their own before they engage in any sort of group work with other, other students. And then uh, when they engage with other students in a group setting, and oftentimes that's on sort of a discussion board or something like that, uh, where there is an asynchronous group back and forth happening, that's where the application and analysis takes place. Okay, so in my past online courses, uh, you structure them on weekly on a weekly module basis. So in a typical module, which would run from Monday to Sunday, let's say, um, I'd release uh, some activities for students to do uh, on Sunday night, and so they spend Monday and Tuesday working through these introductory activities that give them first contact with new ideas about calculus or whatever. And then uh, they would turn something in uh, to certify that they've done this and to give me some data about what they know and what they don't know. And then the Wednesday, Thursday of that week would be spent uh, working together as a group on the discussion board, uh, whatever tool you might want to use, um, on something that's a little bit higher level, like the middle third of Bloom's taxonomy, the analysis and apply part. And uh, so that might, in my case, that took the form of, uh, of uh, little application problems that are not extremely hard, but they're not extremely easy either. And just giving those to student groups, okay, you folks are in charge of this problem, you folks are in charge of this problem, and setting them up to work together and then post a solution for the entire class to discuss. So it's the analog of working at the board in a, in a synchronous class meeting. And so did students get their first contact with new ideas before the group setting? Yes. Uh, did they then use the group setting to apply those activities, doing something dynamic and interactive? Yes, okay. And so, and then the rest of the week could be spent on whatever, a more discussion or assessment or whatever the case may be. So it's a, you, you can partition an online class into a flip setting. In fact, it's quite well set up for that. In fact, uh, hybrid courses in particular are perfectly aligned for, uh, for flip learning. Yeah, there's almost no, structure, construction needed, it works right out of the box. And for online, you just have to have a good discussion board. And that seems to be the bottleneck in most most technological cases. Now, are, are you using a lot of um, cameras, uh, video, uh, or Zoom rooms that are very popular? I've been doing Zoom rooms mm -hmm. for years. And the um, and if not, how, are, how do you bridge that one? If students don't have good bandwidth or access to the mm -hmm. video mm -hmm. cameras, and just to, uh, kind of uh, add uh, one more piece to that. What if students don't want to participate or um, in, in that group activity, how do you uh, assess their learning? Okay, so let me unpack the, the first question first, which is about sort of the, the technology and how we interact. Uh, I have not used uh, like live Zoom or Shindig. This tool is really great actually, uh, I wanna look into this. Uh, like. Uh, like live cameras for that sort of thing in the past, like ever. I, I love Zoom and I use it all the time, but I've never used it in a class for that kind of setting. Uh, no real reason for that, I just haven't done it. What I have done in the past is have students um, 
record themselves at a whiteboard working out problems, okay, as part of their assessment procedure. So they have online homework. Uh, we use a system that will give, some, give them with some exercises and they'll type in an answer and they'll tell you whether the answer is right or not, but it doesn't check the work. And so I've had students, I would have students just take their phones or borrow a phone and go to a whiteboard or just a, like a post-it note and write it or write something on here and record yourself working through the problem and then post it to a YouTube channel that we have for the class. So that's, that's something that doesn't require a ton of bandwidth and it can be done uh, sort of when they have the chance to do it. Like they could come on campus or they could go to their library and use their phone, use a whiteboard, use a big piece of paper. I've had students write on their refrigerators before because they couldn't find anything in their own apartments. Uh, in the, and recently I've just been going with straight text and just using a, a discussion board tool called uh, Campus Wire. Uh, it's a relatively new uh, product, still very much a beta product, but it's a really great sort of mashup between uh, a discussion board and like a Slack workspace. It has sort of the immediacy of a Slack chat back and forth, but it also has a threaded discussion so it doesn't get too wild and crazy. And it also lets me enter in math notation. Uh, math notation for me in my discipline is a huge bottleneck for, uh, for internet-based uh, text tools, just being able to enter things in. So I've been kind of keeping it simple with the technology and not trying to do too much with the video. Although I think you make a point that the video uh, really adds something to the uh, sort of the human experience. And so I think if the next time I do a, a, an online or hybrid course, I'm going to do more with that, like with Flipgrid or something uh, where students are can see each other, can talk to each other. I think you really, it's a really important thing that you don't want to lose. Flipgrid is really um, stepping up their um, product. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it has come a long fun. way, and of course, it's just been purchased by Microsoft, and so now yeah. you got the full force of yeah. the Microsoft empire, you know, uh, driving uh, the, the tech in there. Uh, you were asking another question. I forgot what it was. The second question, not about technology, but about, oh, about student participation. <laughs> Uh, this is a toughie because, you know, what I've learned, I mean, I've been teaching for over 20 years and what I've learned is uh, you can't make students do anything. Okay, It's got to be sort of their idea. And that is no different between online, hybrid or face to face courses. If I have a face to face course and I want students to work at a board and some student just really just wants to sit there and with their head down, I can assess them on it. But in the end, I can only encourage them. <laughs> it has to be sort of consensus building all the way. It's a, something I'm also learning as department. You can't, I have no authority whatsoever. I only I have to build consensus for everything. Uh, and so you, what I try to do, the only thing I can do is give students stuff that they would want to work on that's easy to get right. And what I mean by that is uh, I would have students in the in that problem posting exercise that I mentioned, all they have to do is just post something that's reasonably complete. If it's full of errors, full of holes, full of nonsense, that's totally fine because that gives us something to discuss further. And so I'm only assessing students on whether they do the thing. And then also I require that they follow up on the thing some way or another. I'll put, come in and post some questions about, well, I, I had a question about this line over here, or maybe somebody else does. And they have to back up and actually answer the question at some point. Yeah. And so it's like a two point activity. It's real easy, and, but just gets people off their, you know, or on their feet, so to speak, and uh, actually doing something with the rest of the class. Now, one, one more question. Thank you. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, one more thing that popped into my head was to ask you, how long does it take to make a classroom, a flipped classroom? Because a lot of professors think this can be done maybe in a week or two, or some may, or some may think this could be three months or four months. So yeah, it wouldn't be it more than a week. <laughs> what, is your, what is your timeline for flipping a class that has never been flipped before? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I was giving a, a workshop on flip learning at a university once, and it was the week before classes started. And I was so nervous because I was so afraid that people were going to get all fired up about flip classrooms and just go do it. And that would just be a total disaster. Unless you're starting from, say, a hybrid course like that's like halfway there already. Uh, it definitely takes more than a week. I actually have, a, have this post on my blog about what I call the one year plan. I don't think that it necessarily takes a year to design, to redesign or gut and remodel a class to make it a flipped experience, but I really feel comfortable with a year. And that's that's not only coming from zero at flipping, that's coming from zero at active learning, period. So that's a plan where somebody who has never even touched active learning can go from being a straight lecture person to 
doing effective flip learning in the course of one calendar year. Uh, if you're familiar with active learning and you've been building it into your courses, you're way ahead of the game. All you got to think about is the uh, sort of uh, the flipping the structure of the course, like the assignments in class and out of class. Uh, D. Fink has this great workbook about the design of, uh, of significant learning experiences. And he has this thing called a castle top diagram, where it's like you, you do some stuff before class and then after class, then before class, and then after class. And that's how you design your course. And flipping, that's literally flips on its X axis, where the stuff that you were normally doing before, now you've got to think about doing it in class. So that takes some time to sort of get right, I would say. And for me, if I were doing this from zero, I'd want to prototype this first before I go full on into a semester long experience. I could read truly miserable if you if you get stuck not knowing what you're doing. So I would say, so like I said, uh, at the very bare minimum, this is like a summer project. Like if you're teaching something in the fall, you're really thinking about flipping a class, uh, give yourself the summer to like read D. Fink's book, get familiar with some of the basic concepts of active learning. Uh, uh, like Jim Lang's small teaching book is a great, great go-to resource uh, for that sort of thing. And then get the design right. Okay. So that's the, take some time, but it, it's more than a week, but it's less than a year. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Very much. Uh, if you're, if you're new to the forum, uh, this is how easy it is to ask video questions. Um, and uh, what really helps is when we have a guest like Professor Albert who answers so deeply and so generously. Um, I can see the spirit of your, uh, of, uh, your flipped classroom at work right now. Um, the, uh, um, uh, just a couple of quick notes and, um, and then I want to bring another uh, participant up on stage. Uh, uh, first of all, can you just repeat the name of that book? Um, uh, it was book, the one with the uh, castle. Um, uh, it's actually a workbook. It's not even a book. It's it's called, uh, it's by D. Fink, D-E-E -E Fink, F-I-N-K. And it's uh, the design of significant learning experiences. Significant learning experiences is definitely in the title. I should probably get this right if I'm going to name it right. <laughs> okay. I'm well, going to do it right now uh, while you're I just, <laughs> It's actually available for free online. Uh, I, I just uh, Googled it. It's called, uh, okay, you're going to post it. Designing significant learning experiences. Yeah, okay. That's what it's called. Here, here is a 370. I'm oh, sorry, 317 page PDF um, that uh, oh, that's everyone. Sure can that. It may not be the right one, but uh, I also have a. I, if anyone wants to uh, tweet me or email me, I have a, a workbook of my own that I wrote, kind of inspired by Defink's workbook called Seven Steps to Flip Learning Design. Um, and uh, I'll, maybe I'll shoot that out on the on Twitter with the FTTE tag here, and so people, it's free, so just take it. Um, that's fantastic. Um, speaking of which, uh, you, uh, you you mentioned uh, uh, Shindig. I'm sure we can get you a, a free account. <laughs> um, I wasn't shilling for a free uh, Shindig account, but it's a really nice tool. I can see this. I could really really see uh, how this could be used with students. We've been using this for almost four years, and uh, I'm very fond of it. Um, so uh, let's see if we can do that. Um, but we had a question uh, from the uh, excellent Kelly Walsh, and uh, I don't just say that because uh, I love all my guests. Um, and all the participants, but we've had Kelly actually as a guest on the program before. Uh, mm -hmm. Kelly is a CIO in uh, upstate New York, and he, um, among other things, does a, uh, a runs a consultancy in flipping classrooms. So we have two. I am outnumbered by two flipping gurus. Right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Kelly, how are you? Hey, you? Robert, good to see you. Hi, Brian. We, Kelly and I have been tweeting and emailing each other for probably four or five years, but I've never actually spoken to you in person before. So this yeah. is a world we live in, you know. Well, well, nice to, uh, to meet you. I, I think I had actually uh, <laughs> plugged your uh, name into Brian's head a, a while back. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. Okay. So, um, one of the, in the chat, a question that came up that comes up so often in this scenario is, what do you do when the students don't do the pre-work? Now, of course, my, I always tell people, well, I mean, to some extent, that's not much different than students not doing homework. It's always been a problem. Right. But mm -hmm. There are, you know, various techniques, and uh, I'm just curious what, what you, how you like to approach that. Okay, great question. It's what, probably the, if there's two questions I get more often than any. That's like 1A or 1B. I'm not sure which one it is. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that in my work with flipped learning, this actually doesn't happen too often. I, I think sometimes people get 
to kind of jump right to a worst possible case scenario where the worst case scenario, the doomsday scenario in a flip class would be you come in as an instructor and literally nobody has done any work whatsoever. They are completely unprepared. They're at zero, completely blank slate. I can say that that has never happened to me. And 10, 12 years of running flip learning environments, uh, that that's sort of like everybody is completely unprepared, Very uh, has never happened. I've had situations where three or four students out of 30 might be completely unprepared. And I've had situations where maybe most of the students are really confused about one point. Uh, but uh, that, so I almost question the premise in some ways, like, what do you do if this happens? Well, this, this doesn't actually happen that often. But if it were to happen, <laughs> this is what I would do. And this is, I think, uh, you know, the first thing I can tell you what you don't do, and that's you don't fall back and reteach the material that they were supposed to have learned. You absolutely have to set the boundaries for the way the classroom is going to run. And this will really put some students at a disadvantage momentarily, but it will help them later on. Because what we're about with flip learning is we're trying to get students not only to learn the material, we're also trying to get them to learn how to learn the material. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a really, really important facet of flipped learning, and it's really what higher education is supposed to be all about. It's right. higher education, it's education about education itself. Um, so when the, the worst thing you could possibly do is say, okay, well, I'll just reteach them too, because that just signals to the students like, oh, this is great. Anytime I don't want to do the work, I just won't. And the professor will just drop back and, and it'll, it'll be just like high school, just, just like all my other courses, right? So what you do have to do is say, um, okay, we're not going to reteach the material because that was your responsibility. And in college, we're all about responsibility, okay? Right. Uh, now, what we will do is I will give you a chance to, you know, I will give you 10 minutes to peruse the material and come up with any any uh, specific question that you have on the material that you were supposed to have learned. OK, just give it a little bit of shot. Let's start with you. In other words, let's let's start with what you can do with the material. Yep. Okay. If you can look at the at the section on calculus on it's a, like a section out of a calculus book, and you may have not have read it, but you can look through the first couple of sentences and read like the word functions. Like, oh my gosh, I don't know what a function is. Well, raise your hand and let's start there. Okay. We're not going to give up on active learning, and we're not going to give up on you, the students, generating the questions. Okay. That's the absolute bare minimum, like minimum viable product for a flip classroom. Um, and then, you know, you'd have to have a pretty good conversation with the students about what the expectations are and how this is going to run and especially the why behind what why we are using a flipped learning environment and what the expect and what the roles for me, the teacher and you, the student are going to be. That all has to happen in that class period. Okay? Yep. So it has to be sort of a, a come to the altar moment in some ways. Um, and I think most students get it. I think if you explain why and and, and really follow through on these things and, and also keep the pre-class work relatively simple and easy to complete. Uh, I think one of the great firewalls against the sort of doomsday experience that you're mentioning, Kelly, is just having pre-class work that is engaging. Um, mm -hmm. Don't just give students, read chapter three. Okay, well, how, how the hell do I read chapter three? I mean, I, this is like Beowulf. I don't know what this is, or this is a student's calculus book. Mm -hmm. I mean, how am I supposed to read this? Uh, instead, give them something that's simple that's something that they can do, and that's fairly failure tolerant, I would say, too. Uh, like the way that you assess that in class work or pre class work is really important. I, t I grade that work only on completeness and effort, and I they, they do it by using Google uh, Forms and Google Spreadsheets. And so they submit a Google form with their answers to questions. I can scan the spreadsheet and uh, I can see what they know and what they don't know. And I tell them, look, I want to know what you're struggling with. If you're getting something wrong, that's great. That's awesome. It always starts with getting something wrong, right? And I want to know what it is. That way I can finally tune what we do in class to exactly what you're going to do. But if you're not going to do this work, I can't help you with this. I mean, I'm not telepathic, right? I got to know what you're what you're thinking. And that's what this pre-class work is all about. So when, I, when I've explained it in those terms, it's like I'm not trying to audit you. I'm trying to just get into your head and see what you know and what you don't know. So I'll know what to do next. I let you go first, okay? This is like a turn-based game. And instead of the instructor going first all the time, the student goes first and the instructor goes second. <laughs> that resonates with, I, I had this issue with my hybrid students this semester, actually. Uh, they weren't coming in like totally unprepared. They were doing kind of a superficial job of the pre-class activity. So they were doing it and getting points for it, but it wasn't really sticking. 
And I, I phrase it to them in those terms about you go first, I go second. They're like, oh, OK, that's how it's supposed to work. It's not so threatening now. I mean, you're going to go. I'm going to go. OK, I'm going to have a turn and you're going to get this. OK, you're not I'm not just checking out of the class completely because I'm lazy or whatever. Uh, I'm just going second. That, you know, that's it's funny. I mean, I've been learning about this for uh, since 2012 and I've never heard that particular analogy, but it's, it's a great one. Right. I just came up with it on the spot. When I, doing, I think I've been playing a board game with my son the night before, and I thought I had this idea of like somebody's got to go first. So why should it be me all the time? Right. 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 So uh, <clears throat> another question, uh, much more of a longer term thing. So you know, myself and, and and I'm part of the Flip Learning Network at fliplearning.org. Right. Um, and great you know, organization, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, founded by uh, uh, Aaron, Sam's, and John Bergman, and kind of. Yep widely recognized pioneers, although others were uh, doing it at the time as well. But so now it's been kind of a decade of flip learning. And I think those of us who have been immersed in it feel maybe a little frustration. I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's spread continuously in a very grassroots kind of fashion. So I think, you know, practically any school out there, uh, even K to 12 uh, and of course higher ed, you're going to find people who are aware of this and are probably doing it. Um, it's not um, and, and there are actually entire university systems, uh, although most of them outside of the U.S., um, that have adopted the model. Uh, but that being said, there's still so many people who have not heard of it, don't understand it. Um, and I, I, I struggle with, is it is the term becoming just kind of old and therefore it's losing some of its excitement or, you know, what what needs to happen to continue to raise awareness of this? You know, what's kind of the long term trajectory? And I'm that's, that's, yeah, that, that is a really great question. I think about that quite a bit myself. And I don't know. I you're correct that, I mean, flip learning is growing. I mean, I have these posts that I do once a year on my blog where I go through and do a little lit search on any uh, peer-reviewed publication that's been published between year in and year now uh, in the last 12 months that has flip learning or flip classroom or inverted classroom or any some of the other synonyms in there, the title of the abstract. That's been growing exponentially for, for ever since 2014, it seems like. Wow. And so this just keeps growing and growing and growing, but you're right. I mean, it's still, it's still, we're still kind of in the early adopter phase, it seems like. Um, I, I wonder sometimes if the, the word flipped sort of puts people off. It does have sort of an unseriousness to it sometimes. I think in higher ed, that can, I mean, some people who are like, quote unquote, serious academics don't necessarily want to be doing something as cutesy as flipping, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever you see people doing slide decks about this, it shows people flipping upside down and stuff like that. It's like, eh, this is kind of like amateur hour, it seems like. I personally have no problem with the name, but I can see where some people might. I think what might be the biggest driver of flip learning for me in the next five to 10 years is the sort of the ascendancy of online learning and hybrid learning. Uh, I'm beginning to think like flip learning should be sort of classified in with hybrid, blended, and online instruction as a sort of a form of online instruction. It's not fully online, because it doesn't have to be online at all, but it does have sort of a hybrid feel to it. Sure. I, I, some, I tweeted out a while back, like, okay, give me your best new terms for flip learning, go. And some people gave me some crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think one that came up was a quasi-hybrid Mm -hmm. I think that's a very interesting way to think about flip learning. It's sort of it's sort of hybrid, but not necessarily technologically infused. It's like an analog hybrid, if you will. Mm -hmm. and I kind of like that idea. And as more and more universities, I mentioned to to uh, to Brian at the beginning that at here at Grand Valley, you know, we're thinking very very heavily about you know, rapid expansion of online and hybrid programs and micro credentialing, like a lot of other universities are thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as that trend grows. I think that flip learning could very easily latch itself onto that. So, you know, you know, what, what goes for online learning also could go for us too. And so, you know, if you're not into the tech side of the online learning, think about a flipped environment as well, which is sort of like the hybrid, but you don't have to commit to the tech. And I'm wondering if, if we kind of hitch our wagon to that, that more people will see this for what it is. Like yeah. a really good way to design your courses. Right. Good point. It's, it's you know definitely a form of uh, blended and and it, it's inter you know people seem to get that you know that blend yeah. uh, makes sense and, and works. So in that context, uh, hopefully it's got a, a bright future. Well, let, so. let, let me ask the two of you then really quickly. What should we call classes that are not flipped, not blended, not hybrid, not online? <laughs> 
Mm. Uh, face to face. Yeah. So yeah. Well, face to face is like opposed to online, and so a face to face class can be flipped too. Mm -hmm. I I, I, tend, I tend to fall back on the old term traditional. I mm -hmm. guess because it sort of it it calls to mind the exact right picture. I think you know a person. Mm -hmm. They're not all lecture courses, and lecture itself is not necessarily an inherently evil idea, uh, you know. But when you talk, say traditional classroom, you instantly think of a lecture hall, a uh, middle-aged white dude standing up on on the on top of the stage, and yeah, like all three of us here <laughs> in the picture, in fact, and a sage on the stage, that kind of thing. And it it calls to mind the right sort of thing. Now, traditional classes can be extremely well run. I've seen them. I've been through them myself. Absolutely, they can. Uh, and so this isn't a disparaging term, but I do think that when you say traditional, it 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 connotes the right thing. Yeah, paints the right picture. I would say. Agreed. I'm willing to accept you know corrections to that though because it's a uh, yeah I mean it seems like calling things by the right name is half the battle in higher ed sometimes really can be um, thank you Kelly for the great question and for the suggestion of bringing uh, Professor Albert on stage thank you thank you and great to meet you Robert take care you too Kelly see you learn and uh, and thank you Robert for so so thoroughly addressing these questions um, I mean this gives us more of a hint as to what your what topics are like um, friends we have about ten minutes left. Uh, so this is the time to uh, share your thoughts and questions. Um, we've already covered a wide range from everything from uh, faculty to support to uh, programs to technologies. And in fact, we have another question here from uh, Amanda Burbage. Let me just push this up on the screen so you can all see it. I'd love to hear more about the, I think that scholarship of teaching and learning aspect. What favorite designs or tips could you share? I'm in a faculty support position and this is becoming a priority at my institution. Great question, Amanda. And uh, yeah, this is a one of the great uh, developments in flipped learning as a sort of discipline is that it has become kind of a scholarly discipline with the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at scholarship that is currently in existence on flipped learning, it's kind of a mix of quantitative and qualitative and some mixed methods uh, approaches. Um, quite a few of these studies are sort of classic quasi experiments where a professor might have two sections of world history and they're flip one and not flip the other and then give a common final exam and see how people do on it. That's sort of a, a very a traditional quantitative approach to this. Uh, I think what's interesting, what's more interesting to me because those quantitative approaches are sort of rife with potential validity issues like, okay, well, you made the final exam or, or you might've been really excited about flip learning. And so it creates this Hawthorne effect that boosts final exam scores. And there's all kinds of questions about it. Does it even generalize to somebody else's world history course or outside of world history? I think what, to me, what's more interesting is sort of the qualitative and mixed methods approach to studying flip learning. And that is where you get students into a flip learning environment and just talk to them and make observations about what they're experiencing and then try to draw patterns out of what you observe in their verbal responses or, or their, their behavioral responses. Uh, that's very hard to do, uh, qualitative research. And I, I had to learn all about this. I was on sabbatical a couple of years ago and running some studies, and one of which was a study of how students with, uh, with, with learning disabilities, executive functioning disorders, experience flip learning environments. Uh, for example, students who have autism spectrum disorder. Uh, how, would, how would an autistic student experience flip learning? I know this because I had an autistic student in a class that was flipped and it was, it was really hard on him, but I could also see where it could really be good for in the right ways if I just knew you know, what the best practices were. And so my collaborator and I uh, took, uh, we had like 150 students in college algebra here at Grand Valley State, and we managed to get uh, five students with learning disabilities, <laughs> only five, uh, because it's hard, we asked them to self-identify as students with learning disabilities, to go through these flip courses. They were specially designed with specially made custom materials to run for the study. And uh, we said, we just simply sat down with them at the end of the semester and asked them a lot of questions about, you know, how do you perceive yourself as a learner now that you've done this flipped environment? How did you perceive yourself before as a learner? You know, what were your biggest struggles? What were your biggest successes? What, what did you like? What did you not like? We got some really great data out of those five students uh, that were very, were quite surprising for us. We would not, I think it would have been impossible to get if we were trying to make everything a number and run t-tests or whatever. So I, I would really recommend, you know, reading up about, uh, anybody who's interested in doing SOTL research on flipped learning or anything, uh, really think about the, the qualitative angle on it. It can really uh, tell some great stories. 
Can you, uh, well, it's, it's always great to hear someone who works with numbers call for qualitative stuff. That, that makes me very happy. It was a very much an alien world for me, and I had to learn from total scratch on this, but it's quite fascinating, yeah. Well, just to take a quick step back, I mean, you mentioned trying to get students more comfortable, and I have to say that you, in particular, have an extra burden of that, because so many of your students have math phobia in different degrees. Absolutely. Appreciate that. But the, to, to come back to this, what were some of the surprises you got in the in history? Well, I think the biggest surprise with it, we just found out that these students with learning disabilities are really good students. Uh, I mean, they practice uh, mindfulness techniques and self-regulation behaviors that I wish that all of my students would, would perceive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, for example, they would, we asked them, like, where did you study? When you were in your individual space preparing for the flipped you know, group space, where did you go exactly to study? Because that's a, it's kind of an interesting question. Like you go to the library, you go to your, are you in a busy space that kind of could conflict with your executive functioning disorder and that kind of thing? And uh, they gave all kinds of different answers, but what they all said was like, I'll go to this one space and that's my go-to, but when it gets too loud, I know I can't think. And so I'm just gonna move off somewhere. Mm -hmm. So they have this sense, built-in sense of how to work around their disability <clears throat> that is really interesting. Uh, that you know they, they know when they are not learning well. And I think that sometimes we think students with learning disabilities, well, they just, they're handicapped in some ways. That's not really the case. They're just sort of, uh, the, the, the old politically correct term is differently abled, but that's actually true in this case. Uh, they, these students have spent 12 years learning how to work around a particular cognitive disability <clears throat> successfully uh, because they've made it into college. Right. So that's just one of the really surprising things. It kind of challenged my own preconceptions about what a student with a learning disability really looks like. Mm. Um, I've got some thoughts on that, but we have another question that just came in. Uh, sure. This is from the uh, excellent Michael Haggins. He says, do you find existing physical classrooms to be a constraint uh, when you flip a course? Uh, they can certainly be a major, major constraint. Um, the, I spent my, I mentioned my sabbatical a while ago. I spent my sabbatical actually with Steelcase Incorporated, which is a, a furniture manufacturer in here in Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan. And a lot of people know them as like high end office furniture, but they also have a uh, very active and robust uh, education sector in the company. They do, they do executive furniture, healthcare furniture, like like waiting rooms and stuff like that. And they also do education. They design active learning classrooms. And so I was working with them to do research on active learning and on active learning classrooms. And so to get back to the question, absolutely space can be a constraint. Uh, it's all about when you're doing a flipped uh, class, the group space is all about activity. It's about getting students to do active learning. And the space can totally constrain this. And the first, the, the, prototype example are the big lecture halls where the seats are bolted to the floor, okay? You, you literally have to twist yourself unnaturally to even turn around to talk with a neighbor if you're doing a think-pair-share activity. I mean, it's, it's, it's every aspect of that space is telling you not to be active. It's telling you to have a seat, face forward, watch the middle-aged white dude on the stage, and he's in charge, okay? As when you go into a classroom that's more flexible, even if it's not a full-blown active learning classroom with really nice chairs and tables that have wheels on them and, and you know, portable whiteboards and scale-up room and stuff, uh, if it's just a room where you can physically or easily pick up the tables and move them around, you create more flow, a uh, physical flow, flow of air, flow of yeah. information, flow of social interaction in that space, and it, it, it sort of supercharges and amplifies the effects of the active learning. That's what we found in the research that we did. Uh, you can do active learning anytime, any place, but there are certain elements of the physical architecture of the room that can serve as a damper and some that can serve as an amplifier. I did a uh, very cruel exercise to my uh, to my students at Georgetown. Did I, did I tell you this? The, um, I think so. Um, so we're, we had a unit on mobile technology, and I, I wanted to make sure that they would see just how strange and surprising mobile technology is. Uh, and the classroom usually meets in a, in a wonderful, wonderful space with lots of uh, very configurable furniture. Um, and we normally, the students normally position it in all kinds of different ways. So I made them put it into rows and I got a, a, a podium for me to address the class with. And the students started exerting, started expressing physical and emotional pain in this process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they, they felt like they couldn't watch each other and they got more and more anxious. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was quite quite an exercise. Uh, before, but I have to say, we were down to the last four minutes. 
Um, so does anybody have a last question uh, that they would like to put to uh, our very, very kind guest? Uh, this is your time. So either uh, click the raised hand or click the uh, question mark to put that in. Uh, while people are desperately trying to do that, uh, let me cover a more future-oriented question. Sure. Uh, I think it was Kelly uh, who uh, uh, asked you about the future, and you said that you saw um, the continuing... Um, uh, uh, you actually used the term very precisely. You said exponential increase in mm -hmm. on this. Um, do you think that... Um, you know, how far will this go? And will the flipped classroom become the normative classroom uh, within, uh, say, 10 years? Well, I think if you look at the, at the past 10 years, uh, the flip learning really began to pick up in the mid 2000s when uh, Aaron Bergman or Aaron Sams and John Bergman wrote this book called Flip Your Classroom, Reach Every Student Every Day in Every Class or something that's with the subtitle. Anyways, a seminal work aimed at K-12 educators. So it started at the K-12 level and gradually sort of and percolated into higher ed. Um, I think that you, you will find more and more people venturing out into this direction of flipped learning. Again, maybe not by name, uh, but by saying, even just sort of coming to their own conclusions, like discovering it on their own in some ways to say, look, I've got all these resources. Why am I lecturing so much? I mean, lecturing is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not an inherent evil, but why am I doing it so much? And are students really learning? I think that there's more and more pressure to sort of, you know, you know, put up or shut up when it comes to student learning in the university. I mean, we need to be demonstrating that students are actually learning what they say that they're learning. And so having more active learning in the classroom kind of makes that makes that uh, much more visible, I would say. And the technological tools are better now than they've ever been. They're only going to get better as, I mean, just look at the tool we're on right now. I mean, uh, this would have been science fiction 10 years ago. 10 years from now, who knows what it's going to be. And so having this, uh, the ability to have students sort of work on their own effectively prior to a group meeting and then making the group meeting really, really great. I think that's gonna be a very attractive prospect and much easier for the average rank and file faculty member to do. And the, the easier the technology gets to use, the more you're gonna see this uh, permeate into the mainstream, I would say. Well, that's a key point. Um, that's a lot of key points. Thank you. Uh, that's a very, very positive look. I, I like the idea of making this visible. Uh, in a way that may uh, also tie into our desire to improve reputation of learning. We do have one one last question uh, from Charles Finley, um, uh, and he asks, you talked about faculty perception, how to change the way students define what learning is supposed to be, you know, not a lecture with an essay final exam. Right. Yeah. So Charles, I have this, I have my students do this exercise on the first day of class every year, and it writes a touchstone for us to come back over and over again to it. I asked them two questions. I asked them, or this isn't a question, but figure out something that you're good at doing. What are you good at doing? It can be school related. It can be not school related, but just think about what you're good at doing and then share with each other at your tables for two minutes. So they come up with, I'm really good at snowboarding, or I'm really good at baking cookies or whatever. And then I come back to them and ask, how did you get to be good at the thing that you say that you're good at doing? How did you become a good snowboarder? How did you become a good baker? Um, this isn't a new exercise. I stole it from somebody else, but I, I, I'll give them credit once I remember who it was. Um, and it's, it's, of course, none of the students say, well, I had this great lecturer on how to bake cookies, or they might say I watched a YouTube video. Okay, that's, that's a legit way to learn something, but you really learn by actually trying to bake the cookies and actually getting on the snowboard and falling on your face and getting back up, and they'll come up with all the right answers. Like it's, it takes practice, but not just any kind of practice. It takes mindful practice, and it takes doing, and it takes failure. And I tell them on day one, it's like, remember everything you're saying, because I'm going to come back to this day day in and day out. And I think that it becomes, it's a messaging issue that we change the perception of what learning really is. Like, it's not about my teaching. It's about your learning, okay? Are you learning the things that you're supposed to be learning in the course? And how do you know? And how do you get there? And learning calculus, learning world history, learning Portuguese, it's like learning anything else. It takes, it takes work, it takes effort, it takes failure, and it takes mindful correction of failures. And it's no different than anything else you've ever learned in your life that's worth something. Okay, so anything meaningful in your life, that's how it works, and I aim to make this meaningful. And, you know, not all students are going to be convinced by that. 
in the 14 weeks that I have them. But of all the best, what I hope at least is that they're going to remember these conversations that I have with them about what learning really looks like. It's not an alien process. It's actually something we all do. We've been doing. It's a uniquely human gift that we have. We've been doing it since we were infants, even before we were born. We were learning. And we were doing it in a certain kind of way. We're still doing it in a certain kind of way. Robert, I love how, how you started off with a very tactical question of, of student attitudes in a particular pedagogy and ended up by easily able to speak about the fundamental nature of learning and uh, humanity as a whole. Um, I, I hate to pause this, but we, we are out of time. Um, let me, first of all, thank you so much uh, for your, your real generous time. Uh, I, I think this is fantastic. I really appreciate how you engaged all of us and how you deeply answered our questions. Um, what's the best way to keep up with your work? Is it uh, via Twitter? Uh, Twitter's good. Uh, that's um, at Robert Talbert on Twitter. Uh, you can go to my website at rtalbert.org. And uh, uh, I kind of cross those two things up. I'll tweet my blog posts out. Sometimes I'll blog about my tweets. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but uh, that's that. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. Or, or if you're ever in the West Michigan area, feel free to just stop in. <laughs> I'll give you a tour of the math department. But oh. Twitter and my website are probably the best ways to kind of keep, keep up with what I'm doing. And of course, your book. Um, yes. Uh, thanks again, um, and uh, I really look forward to bringing you back next year once you've had a chance to uh, overhaul Grand Valley State. You know, <laughs> Just you know, no, no big, no pressure or anything, right? <laughs> Good luck, and thank you again. Thank you, Brian. Uh, friends, don't leave because I have to tell you about what's happening for the next couple of weeks. Uh, so, uh, and thank you, by the way, uh, for so many of you, uh, Michael and Roxanne and Kelly, for your really good questions. Um, next week, we're going to shift gears a little bit to talk about student needs. Uh, this is a fantastic, fantastic report done with just some groundbreaking research about how community colleges can best support their students. So it looks at them as uh, looks at students as social beings and um, and also how they can be served to library in some really exciting ways. So I'm really looking forward to having Melissa Blankstein uh, on uh, on the program. Uh, now, if you would like to uh, follow up with uh, this session or with uh, uh, all, any of our previous sessions, just head to the archive at tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. Uh, we've had previous sessions looking at um, the flipped classroom, the flipped learning, as well as many sessions on pedagogy, technology, and of course, the future of the university. Uh, if you'd like to keep this conversation going, we have lots of ways of doing it. We have uh, groups on uh, Facebook mm -hmm. and on uh, LinkedIn. We have a Slack channel. And the hashtag FTTE is always buzzing on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, keep thinking about this. Flip your classrooms, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks again, and take care. Bye-bye.